because to me, one of the things I loved about teaching improv wasn't just that it was about an acting skill or a comedy skill. It was some people were there who were professional actors and some people were there who were just playing and having fun. And for it to connect to their ability to be true, whatever that meant for them, it would affect their lives, usually in, in a helpful way and sometimes in a profound way. You're listening to The Milk Podcast. This is the show where we talk about motherhood and sexuality with amazing women with fascinating stories to share on the joys of being a MILF. Now here's your host, the milfiest MILF I know, Jennifer Tracy. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for listening. Um, this is MILF Podcast, the show where we talk about motherhood, entrepreneurship, sexuality, and everything in between. My name is Jennifer Tracy. I'm your host. And as I'm recording this introduction, uh, wildfires are blazing across Southern California. Um, it is a devastation. I know several people personally who have lost their homes and everything inside of them. They just got out with their lives and their children. It's really frightening. And this is something that, you know, happens all the time. We have these hurricanes that are for me are on the other side of the country and just watching that and... Then we had this shooting a couple days ago at in Thousand Oaks at this bar. It's times like these that uh, it's so important to come together. And it's no coincidence that today's episode is going to be airing on Thanksgiving Day. So happy Thanksgiving to you. And I hope that you are with your loved ones. And I know I am so grateful for my life and my loved ones and all that I have. And I'm so grateful to give back um, to those that have less or have none. So in light of that, um, on today's show notes, I have included two websites. One is the Red Cross, um, where you can donate. Um, I like donating to the Red Cross because the money goes directly to actual disaster relief. So you can donate to disaster relief um, in a certain area. It's very easy, their website. So it's uh, www.redcross.org. This other charity that I really like, it's called My Two Front Teeth. And they work with the Family Giving Tree Charity. And you go to the website and they have specific children that, that don't that their families can't afford to get them Christmas gifts and they have wish lists. They collect these wish lists. It's very personal and, and sweet. And so you can go on there and pick something to donate for a child that, you know, may or may not be getting any Christmas gifts. Um, and I really like that, you know, but if you don't, if those two don't speak to you, I mean, there's certainly so many others that are out there and there are so many people that need your help and your generosity. And it just takes a little, you know, even if you just, donate a few bucks here or there. It, it all makes a difference. So um, anyway, happy Thanksgiving. I'm so grateful for all of you. I'm so grateful for my listeners, for my amazing, beautiful MILF guests. I'm really grateful for my production team at Fullcast for helping me make this happen every week. Today on the show, we have Aliza Marietta. Aliza is one of my favorite people. She is immensely talented in, in many, many ways. She's an actress. She's a director. She's a producer. She's a writer. She's a mom. She's incredibly generous, incredibly generous. Um, and one of the smartest and funniest people I know. So I got to sit down with her in her home and <laughs> she has two dogs and she had said, I have barky dogs. You know, and I said, well, I kind of do too. So it doesn't really matter where we do it. We'll just have to, you know, get my amazing editor, Derek, to work around it. So thank you, Derek. I know it was a lot to deal with, but I think we got through it okay. Um, so to my lovely listeners, you may hear some dog barking in the background here and there. Just be prepped for it. Um, they are the cutest little things, these two little white, um, I think she said they're coton de tulier or something like that. White fluffy cuties is what they are, hypoallergenic. Um, so anyway, thanks so much for tuning in. I really hope you enjoy the show. Hi, Aliza. 
Hello, Jennifer. Oh my God. I love you so much. I I'm, love you a lot. Too. I'm so happy that you're here and that we're doing this and I'm really excited. I'm excited as well. So just to give a little background, I know you because I came to your theater company to study improv like 17 years ago, maybe. I don't know. I believe you. A really long time ago. Yep. And um, it was such an amazing experience. And you're such an incredible improviser and teacher. And I owe a lot to you because I feel like part of the reason that I'm good at doing this podcast is because of my improv training with you and Sabrina and Ezra and everybody at Bang. So thanks. Thank you. That's, that's <laughs> awesome to hear. I haven't been teaching for a little while, so it, it warms my heart to hear that. So thanks for saying that. And you, how did you get started in improv originally? I've always loved comedy. And when I was living uh, back home after college, I started graduate school in acting. I went to Catholic University for a semester. It was not the right program for me. <laughs> <laughs> I never knew that. Yeah, I had gone to um, uh, Penn for my undergrad. I thought I was going to be a lawyer when I went to college. You did not. Mm -hmm. You did? I what kind of law, law were you going to? By the time I arrived at college, I started taking English and playwriting and theater arts classes because yeah. I, you know, whatever. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't keep myself away from, yeah. from theater, which I had fallen in love with in middle school. Mm. So uh, I was the owl in the Winnie the Pooh play oh. because <laughs> I thought the owl was very smart and I grew up in a family where being smart was kind of important. So I, you know, it was like, Anyway, yeah, that may be too much information. Never too much. Never it may be. Much. It may be. I'd loved theater. I just didn't think I would pursue it. And then when I got to college, it was one of the main things I was doing. After college, I went home. I started grad school at Catholic U because I did not get into Yale or NYU. I'd only applied to a couple programs. I didn't either. I applied to all those big ones. Yeah. The, the ones that only take seven people a year. Yeah. And yeah. I didn't get in anyway. Yeah. And I think I applied to three schools and I got into Catholic University, which was near home. I'm from the DC area. And it was a very straight program. Um, and it's a great theater program, but I was way more avant garde at the time in my sensibility. And it was too straight. I had a teacher from the program. There were several teachers that were internal at Catholic U. And then there were some that came from Arena Stage, which is an amazing theater in Washington. And my Catholic U teacher um, didn't get me. We sat down for a, a meeting. I mean, he was perfectly nice, but I don't think he understood where I was coming from in my work. And the arena stage teacher said, you need to be doing comedy. You're wonderful, but I see you like a whole different. And, you know, this was uh, during a very performance art period in, in the zeitgeist, in the world of what was going on. And he's like, I think this is just from a whole different POV than where you're coming from. He's like, I love your work, but I'm not sure this is the program. And I agreed. So I had a dream that I should move to Chicago. <laughs> yeah, I had a dream I should move to Seattle or Chicago. I was living at home and I came downstairs and told my mother and she's like, okay. I mean, you know, not many people move where they dream they should move. I don't think. I mean, literally dream. Literally Not dream. awake dream. Not like, yeah. So then later that week I dreamt, no, it's, it's Chicago. You need to move to Chicago. So I just did. And that's where I studied improv. When I got there, I um, worked at Second City as an actor. It was just a whole path of, of theater and comedy and improv. So that's where it started. At the time, towards the time I was about to leave Second City, um, both my husband and I taught for Second City in a, a capacity, not, not enormous capacity, but we were um, doing some teaching there as well on a limited, uh, to a limited extent. So that's what started it. And when we got out here, we decided to move out here after we were married. We were surprised that there wasn't much long form improv. It, it was we moved out here in the early to mid 90s and there really wasn't anything happening in that area so we had not come out intending to teach at all interesting what was your intention 
writing and acting. For both of you? Yeah. He, he was more interested in writing and I was more interested in acting, but we did each did both. I remember sitting down and we were talking, we were on Melrose, we lived in that neighborhood and we were just like talking about how can there not be? And we were inspired to bring it because it meant so much to us. And we just saw a lack and saw an opportunity to bring something that was, was pretty great. So that's what did it. And well, so I found Bang via my neighbor, Susie Nakamura, who's an amazing actress, also a Second City grad, yes. And Rose Abdu, also a friend of Susie's, who's a friend of mine. So I found you through Susie because I called her, this was, ni- uh, not 19, this was 2002, maybe. I called her up and I said, I, I need to do improv. Like, I'm ready to do improv. Where do I go? Because at that time, I don't think UCB was around yet, or if it was, it was really tiny. Groundlings was there, but it was so overwhelming, their whole process to me. And I said, what do I do? And she said, oh, you need to go to Bang. Immediately, it was the first thing she said. That's exactly where you need to be. It's lovely. She's like, I know Aliza and Peter. And she just spoke so highly of you both and the program there. And I respected her so much that I said, oh, easy, done. And it was so close to my house. (laughs) So I went and that became my theater home for, gosh, a decade. And I, you know, I'm so grateful to you. And I know dozens of other people. I mean, probably more than dozens, but just right now in my mind, I'm thinking of all our people who are equally as grateful to you guys for having that, having been our home, our theater home for so long. So, yeah. So, okay. So you came here and you said, let's open a long form. Now, was the Groundlings around yet? Groundlings was here. Okay. But it was much more sketch. I mean, it was That's right. like Second long, City and yeah. that I think their improv set and their improv at the time, at least, and I may be incorrect, but um, was towards creating sketch shows, right. which was the, the structure of Second City essentially as well. So, um no, UCB wasn't here. There were there was comedy sports. Oh there were gosh, things like that. Sports but that I mean, we really, we really were surprised and thought it needed to be here. Yeah. So we were before a lot of like UCB came uh, well after we were here, and um, Second City wasn't here yet at the time. Um, there was definitely a little bit of a desert more than we expected in, in that in terms of long form. And thank you for all the nice things you said. And I love Susie and I love Rose. And it uh, was an incredible um, like greenhouse for, for a lot of performers, a lot of great projects. Um, and we wanted to make an open place for people to do that work. And one of our, our founding ideas was we wanted teachers who would work there before, during, and after they were whatever successful means to you. We didn't want a place that you worked until you were successful. We wanted a place where you would you would mentor people. That's all right. You'd mentor people, you'd learn as the teacher, as the director, as the playwright, whatever your function was, you would learn and be able to come back and forth while you were working after you were very successful. And um it wasn't a an until. Yeah. And that was very apparent because there was such a a wide range of experience. Right. And and I really appreciated, like you said, and I'm paraphrasing, but just the openness of it. It wasn't, because I was intimidated by the groundlings. I thought, I mean, I'd acted a ton and whatever, but I just thought, oh, that's so scary. It just feels so scary. And there's levels and you have to, you have to pass to get to this. And I'm like, I don't need more anxiety. I'm already an anxious person. <laughs> like, I don't, <laughs> Yeah, Bang. Just Bang was a place to... Oh, so good. Yeah, and it was very much about uh, about people being equal. If you yes. were taking a class, yes. there were some really exciting people who taught and performed there. But, you know, the idea was everybody's everybody, everybody. matters. Yeah. Everybody. And, and wasn't you know, that your motto? Everybody plays. Everybody was, plays. Yeah, yeah, which is also, I think it's AYSO's motto also. There's a, it's close to AYSO's motto. Motto. What's AYSO? Um, uh, soccer. A- American Youth Soccer. <coughs> At what point did you get pregnant in that journey of opening the theater? We opened Bang, um, no, two years before I got 
No, I'm sorry. We opened Bang a year before I got pregnant, which wasn't necessarily in or not in the plans, but that's its own own story. And we had a space for teaching, not really a performance space, on La Brea and Beverly. It was a second floor over a paparazzi's like secret lair. It was this family that did photography, celebrity photography, which took a while to even understand. It was pretty hidden what they did. Yeah. Okay. They didn't even have a front entrance. They only had a back entrance. So we had this space um, that we called the alley at first uh-huh. because we came in from an alley. We shared it with an acting teacher. Uh, we did improv and he did acting and it was tiny, a tiny space and it worked and we liked it. And so a year after we were in a year lease, after the first year, we decided to move to, to Fairfax and get a performance space etc. As we were building out the Fairfax space, that's when I became pregnant. And we were trying to get pregnant, but we became pregnant immediately upon trying. Wow. Much to both of our delight and surprise. Yes. Um, literally when we, we decided to try. So, so uh, I was building and like putting chemicals on stages and building stuff carefully as I was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of consider them my twins. I have two boys. The first one was born as we were first in that space. So, wow. Okay. So then your first son Mm -hmm. is now in college. I Mm -hmm. cannot even believe it. Because I used to, a little bit of trivia for my listeners. I went to Bang and I studied at Bang and, and Aliza asked me to babysit. And it was such an honor. And I got to come. So, um, your littlest one was, Six months. So the, your older son was um, six, I guess, because they're seven. He years was, apart. They're six years apart. Yeah. So he was um, he was seven or six or seven. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the little one was six months, and it was just such a joy. And so you had the first your first son, your older son, who's now in college, which is amazing, and he's um, also incredibly talented baseball player. <laughs> uh, and my son idolizes him. By the way, oh, you should know. Really yeah, nice. he still remembers like meeting him and talking about baseball like one time and he that's asks really about him. sweet yeah it's really cute but uh, having been on the other end of it when people older than my oldest um and i have two boys so the people older older than he would do something once and it would make such an impression you just you don't realize how resonant something can yes. be for somebody and that's true with adults too it but is. it's sweet because when you just said it i'm like oh come on really he your son really still remembers it made an impact like that's such nice. a big impact well and but in fairness he your son is, we can just call him number one son. number one number one son is um an exceptional human being i mean he's just always been from the time he was little incredibly grounded and wise and generous and He's also just super easygoing, easygoing. easy to be around. He's yeah. not, he's just pleasant. Yeah. He's a pleasant, pleasant soul. So, okay. So you birthed a theater company. Mm-hmm. Then you birthed a human. Yes. <laughs> I did both. <laughs> um, what was that like having a theater company that you were in charge of, basically? Because your husband was working on other stuff at the time. I mean, he was part of the theater company too, but it, this was your gig. Yes. It was most of the my time, child yeah. for, for many, many, many years because um, it was almost 20 years old. When It is no longer now. It is closed, but it was approaching 20 when we decided to close it. It was an exciting time at the same time that I had number one and, and the theater. Um, I, think I, I think part of it's youth and having energy, and I lived close, intentionally close by, walking distance to the theater should I want to walk, which sometimes I did. <laughs> I wish I did it all the time, but I have to be honest. Maybe I don't have to be honest. I walked every day. I think the excitement of teaching, the excitement of helping people connect to their truth, because to me, what I loved about teaching, one of the things I loved about teaching improv wasn't just that it was about an acting skill or a comedy skill. It was Some people were there who were professional actors, and some people were there who we're just playing and having fun and for it to connect to their ability to be true, whatever that meant for them, it would affect their lives usually in, in a helpful way. Um, and sometimes in a profound way. So 
that was exciting. And then I was the artistic director in terms of shows that would come there. And I ran many shows. So I think when you do things you love, it energizes you. I would say that the first year of being a parent was hard in me. And I don't think I understood what was happening in the sense that I felt, I don't want to say an aloneness, but I think having going through the process and I'm a very, um, and even at the time, I was even more controlling of a person. I like to control things when I can. I think I've learned with time and life and parenting to release that and not try to as much. But I think it was um, a strange period that I'm not even sure I could explain. If you asked me what was, I wouldn't say, oh, I had postpartum. But I think I felt... Like it was a difficult year in retrospect. It was a really one of the hardest years of my life. What should be, it should's a bad word, of course, but what, what might be the most joyful, and it was a joyful time. It was also a strange time of learning how to be, the, be a parent. Yes. And I think some people have a lot of grace understanding how to be a parent. Some people have, you know, biochemical things where it's like postpartum or whatever. That's a whole different thing. But I had a big adjustment. It was it was something I didn't even understand was happening till I looked back and thought that was not a fun and easy year. Yeah. In yeah. many ways. So I would say that was a harder adjustment. Um, but all in all, I think the excitement of being at that theater and of the things we were doing made it a pleasure. Mm. So um, I don't think it's as hard as people, male or female, who have children and have to go to a job that maybe is not as joyful or fun to be at. Right. So, so I, I felt um, happy. I had a lot of time with my child. I had people like you who could watch my children. And then um, I also had somewhere I wanted to go. And I generally was working at night. Sometimes I was teaching in the day or doing rehearsals in the day. But a lot of my work when, when my boys were young was at night. So for one, I don't, I'm a bad cook. And <laughs> I, I was cooking when I was first married. And then I realized like I worked so many nights a week when my kids were small. I think like, I just feel like I kind of sloughed off my ability to be a delightful cook. Um, and my husband who has many talents, including in the home, is not interested in cooking. So I think we could have planned better when we decided to fall in love with each other <laughs> that one of us would have been a better cook. Both of my siblings have married people who are great cooks. Mm. And I, I just, we did not yeah. handle that one well. We've done a lot of other things well, but that we kind of screwed well, up. Well, good thing you're in a town where there's amazing restaurants. And nowadays, not, not back then, but nowadays we have Postmates and we have Instacart. And you're all. right. We I mean, we, we no, I do not. We do eat out. We do eat out. However, what I do well is organize good food. I would not say I cook a lot. I do cook. I, I grill. Like there's things I can do. I'm not terrible, but I like, I love fresh, great food, which we also get here. Yes. Like, we're farmers very markets fortunate. and things yeah. like that. So please don't, listeners, please do not think that I've starved myself or my family, but that's the dirty truth about my sense of my cooking. Yeah, I get it. I mean, there's just, we all have those things that are just not our things. For me, I don't like doing laundry. Um, I love it. See? I don't always do it, but yeah. I like it. It's finite. It's clean. It's very, I see, it's like the controlling part of my brain where it's just very uh not rigid it's just uh it's a task it's finite it's organized i think m many people don't know what the heck they're oh doing my God. how can you there's just no well, some people some people have do. resources where people will tell them or that or they know but i think it's about communication i i think mm, yeah i don't i don't think people told there were things people hadn't told me that i was like Oh my gosh, this is happening in my pregnancy or in my with my baby, and people are like, oh yeah. So I don't know. I think yeah. I think mm, <laughs> now there's a dog talking outside that they have to answer. Oh. Anyway, okay. so you have um, number one son, 
I lo- I'm going to call him that now when I see him, by the way. He, that crazy. is actually what my husband calls is it? him. Is yes. It? It's yes. so great. I mm-hmm. love it so much. Mm-hmm. So you have number one son, you have the theater. It's thriving. Mm-hmm. It's thriving. And then what makes you guys say, it's time. We're going to have another kid. Like, is that what ha- Tell Tell me that story. I wanted to have uh, three or four children. I, my, I think my husband was saying maybe two or three, you know, in a perfect world where you imagine and discuss what you might have and see what happens. So um, I had wanted to try to get pregnant again when number one was like three. It would have been maybe like a four-year gap instead of a six, which we have. My husband wasn't ready. I had a very, very difficult pregnancy. I actually had two very difficult pregnancies. Um, My mom, I'm a DES baby. I don't know if you know about this. It's a drug. I, I couldn't even say the whole thing for you, but... There's a drug that was given to women. I believe it started around the 1920s or 30s and ended in the 70s. It was a form of synthetic hormone that was supposed to help you not miscarry. It was also given to women to help them, I think, with milk production once they'd had babies. And there's a lot of problems with synthetic hormones. So um, when you're a woman who was given it, and it was given a lot. Like I'm at the tail end of when it was given, but it was given a lot through the 1900s. And there are many health problems associated with it. So there's issues that the, the mothers have and there's issues that the daughters and sons and now grandchildren can have. So because my mother was given it midway in her pregnancy, she had a car accident and she had tried to get pregnant with me. I'm in the middle of three. She had tried for five years to get pregnant with me. My mother was given it, luckily, not early in her pregnancy, like halfway through her pregnancy. She had tried very hard to conceive me, my parents had, and then she was worried she was going to lose the pregnancy because she was actually spotting and and the doctor gave it to her. Um, So she didn't have any health issues from it, but because I had had that exposure in utero, there's issues. um, The main, I mean, I'm okay, I'm fine, knock on wood, um, but When I learned that this had happened as a teenager, when my mother brought it to my attention, I was very upset. It's part of my distrust of Western medicine. And um, however, as an East Coast, you know, like I grew up loving doctors. My family is like all about medicine and doctors. I'm not against Western medicine. I believe in Western medicine working. And I also think there's a lot in natural uh, medicine that can be very helpful too. So I was very shaken by this. So I've always been good about making sure and, you know, seeing doctors and no problems, but there's a high risk of cervical cancer or cervical abnormalities for women, especially when they're around 19, 20, 21, like in the early young womanhood. And then there's also often an incidence of um, uterine, I would say incontinence, which I'm sure isn't the right term, but having trouble holding a pregnancy, which I didn't have. But what I did have was preterm labor for both of my pregnancies. So I was on bed rest. We didn't know that having number one, I didn't expect I'd be on my back for part of it. I wasn't as much as I uh, you know, could have been, but I had months of bed rest. And I also had that with number two. But for number two, I went in expecting it. And I planned where I was just running doing everything I'd done with my first kid. And all of a sudden it's like, you know, the minute he started kicking is when I started having contractions, but they weren't contractions that were going to make me have him, but we didn't know. So there was, there were a lot of things I had to do. So they were difficult pregnancies. So to go back to your question, my husband was not ready to try to have another kid. And I think subconsciously or consciously, he felt like he watched me be in danger. Like I'm sure subconsciously he felt like my wife's going to die because I was hospitalized at one point in the middle of my first pregnancy and they were worried I was going to have the baby too early. And, you know, there were things we went through that were frightening that I probably being inside it don't know how frightening it looked being outside it. Had he been on board, we would have tried to have another kid earlier and maybe would have had three or would have just had two closer in age. But I was all for having a lot of kids. I always thought it would be fun. Two is what I can handle, and it all worked out great. Like, I'm very grateful 
for the situation we have and for the kids who showed up to be in our family. So I'm just going to trust that if we'd had three, maybe there would have been like a super evil child. And, and <laughs> I need to respect because I am a kitty. Reg- kitty a, would have come back there you and go. angry for. <laughs> I'm a good regretter. Like I have a, a I'm pretty well practiced at regret. So often instead of being like, I can't believe I have two of the most nice, interesting, wonderful children who've shown up and I actually still have a great relationship with my husband. Like I've got, there's things that that have turned out how, as I would have hoped in my life and things that haven't. I'm really lucky on the family front, knock on wood. Things have been really, I've been really fortunate. I've worked hard at it, but sometimes things just happen or don't happen and you can't, you just take what the cards deal. And I've been lucky in that, in that game of life poker of what showed up. Um, but I would have liked more children. and. You know, uh, my husband is definitely a, a cup half full and I think I'm an optimist, but I'm often like, oh my God, my cup is only full with these great kids. Where's that one you wouldn't let me have? <laughs> Which of course is the daughter, right? That would have been my daughter. Right. Because I have boys and right. I love being the mother of boys. So I really love it. And, um, but I always imagine myself with girls. Like if I was, Young, I mean, talking about as a child imagining having children. So there's that. But um, my husband finally conceded, and then we tried for another. And that was not an immediate, like with my first where I think, you know, number one was looking down, waiting for the opportunity. When we got pregnant with number two, I have a friend who's uh, a psychic and very spiritual, as you would imagine. (laughs) She's like, I don't know, there's a kid checking out, you know, maybe coming down, but uh, that kid's not so sure because it was a terrible time. It was post 9-11. So then you have two kids. You have this theater company that's thriving. Um, eventually, you guys closed the theater company because it had its time. Do you want to talk more about that? Or? Well, I probably don't want to go in way into depth, but right. basically, I felt like I felt things were really amazing and magical at that theater. But I feel that my structure for that place and, and my husband's was, it was a place we, we wanted to give a lot and we didn't focus on it as a business in the sense of we put money that came in and it was successful, went back into it. And I don't think that I understood my own worth in terms of rewarding myself. I paid my teachers, I think, very generously, but I didn't, is the word remunerate? Renu- you know, I didn't take care of myself in that way. It was a labor of love, but I think labor of, labors of love can be successful businesses as well. So I think it was an incredibly successful business where careers came out of it, marriages came out of it, children came out of it. It was, it was a wonderful thing we created, but I don't know that um, I, even to this day, understand the monetary aspect and also that I valued my own um, input monetarily. I did artistically. I'm really, I mean, it may be one of the biggest things that isn't number one or number two child um, that I'm proud of that I created, but I definitely don't think I structured it understanding that aspect of business. So in that sense, it was a drain because of having started that way. Um, And also I had some health issues that came up and then there were other people who stepped in to help or to caretake, some of whom I think did a great job and some of whom I think- Caretake um, the theater. Yes. So I think it became distanced from the original vision and when you have different generations of people taking care of it, it starts to be something different. But I had the impulse that it should be stopped before I had health issues, before, you know what I mean? Yeah. It just felt like um, that I felt it was incredibly successful, but there were things artistically I wanted to do and I needed to go do my own work instead of um, the path I had taken there of doing my own work and also being very committed to making other people successful and to bringing the best out in other people, which brought the best out in me. And I, it was, it was nourishing to me, 
But at a certain point, it was time for me to do some other things for myself to but people weren't listening to me. For many years, I was saying, it's time to shut this. And I had a lot of resistance that this is important. And it was for other people. So that was a, an interesting um, opportunity for me to figure out how to do that. And I think my health issues may have been myself making it yeah. happen, you know? Yeah. So And yeah. so forth. And are you currently... Um pursuing because you said that there are other things that you wanted to pursue and create are you oh see, i stopped petting him for one second he's like wait 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 <laughs> excuse me um he's so sweet are you pursuing those things now because you because your your sons are older so you have a, a high schooler and a collegeer. i know mine's gonna be a high schooler and a collegeer in a blink of an eye too but you know, one is entirely self-sufficient. I mean, they never are really. Like my mom, I'm 43 and my mom always says, well, you're still my baby girl, you know, and I get it. But what are you up to now? I mean, I know what you're up to, but can you share a little bit about what you're... Yes. Yeah. Essentially, I'm writing, which has been something that I did when we had the theater, but I mainly was writing for the stage. Some of it was was not scripted, what, what I worked on, but writing for the stage and also developing things for television. I had some script or some stage shows optioned and uh, didn't end up being made, but developed things for Paramount and some other places. So I've been delving into novel writing, which has been going great. And that will be something I'll have to update you on. It's something I can tell you any specifics, but that's been wonderful. And sort of an opportunity for me to, to teach myself how to do that, to not feel I have to go learn from someone. I do have a writing group that is a huge source of helping me develop and my helping other people develop um, because of being an improviser and working with other people to create. Uh, because writing can be so solitary, I find the process of connecting weekly with my writing group to be critical to my progress and to my development, to my projects that I'm working on, getting beyond where they would get if I only had my own echo chamber and my own instinct, which are great. You know, they serve me, but having ears and eyes that I trust and being able to be that for other people is wonderful. Absolutely. And, and just to, I mean, for me, the accountability, it, it's just such a simple thing. Of like Yeah, that's the, true. Knowing you have to now, do you go to a place for this for this group? Yes, for oh. the club. Were you going to say the club? I was going to say the club. Oh my god! <laughs> okay, so I'm dating I, myself. I got invited into this writing group. I think D Ryan, who's another second oh, city yeah, person, of course I know D. Um, invited me into this group, and it's a wonderful group. It's a weekly writers group. We we're meeting, I, I just hesitated because I'm like, oh, will I get the group in trouble? But we, I don't think so. We were meeting at the Writers Guild for many, many years because many members of the group are, are in the Writers Guild. Something happened at the Writers Guild. This is kind of a, a crazy, maybe it's not crazy. Here's the story. It's not crazy. It's completely human nature story where one person screws everything up mm. for everybody else who kind of follows the rules. So there's a book where you sign out hours to work at the Writers Guild. You're allowed the conference room there because there's a space where writers will sit mm. and work. It's sort of like a, a big room, like you would imagine in a newsroom where there's a pool area where there's yeah. desks and things where people can all work, but there's a conference room. Right. And you can go in there and have a meeting, have a practice pitch, whatever. Mm -hmm. So you're allowed to sign it out for two hours, I think a week. Okay. But a two-hour time stretch, and they have a book at the front. So we would meet every week for mm -hmm. two hours. So suddenly we come in and the book's gone. And there's a number of things that happen with the guard at the front where you check in. And what it turns out is someone had gone in the book and signed out like 30 hours a week or 20 hours a week in different spots. <sighs> like, But it got to the point where they're like, well, now we're taking the book away mm. and you have to do it this way. And then you have to do it this way. And it was really one entity one person who had just decided they were going to create their own office oh, in the space that a geez. lot of writers needed to use. And it made the guild very angry. Yeah. So the system got blown up at the same time across the street from the guild. My husband has 
an office, his own office space at the farmer's market, at the old farmer's market of Hollywood. So I don't know why, again, I guess it's about being, being creative in my own thinking. I hadn't really thought like we pay rent on an office space there. I could be in that space writing. So all of a sudden it dawned on me, I need to invite my group across the street. We never have to sign a book out. We can have it anytime we want. Nobody's going to knock on the door and say, I have the next two hours. You guys need to hustle. So it's become almost like it is like a clubhouse. It's like a tree house because we're on the second floor and we sit and we can talk as long as we want and we can. And you can go downstairs to Bob Donuts afterwards. Not that you would ever eat Bob's Donuts, but like they have so many other things. Yeah. So many other wonderful places that you can go get food afterwards. It's wonderful. That's so, so great. Yeah. So I'm really, I mean, I don't know why I didn't think of it sooner, but it's wonderful. It's huge. That's awesome. And um, I know we're not going to talk about the book specifically in terms of story and stuff, but can you tell me the genre of it? Because it's pretty cool. Um, do you know what it is? Well, I think you said it was sci-fi. Well, Am I not? Is that wrong? You know what? It's... Well, because there's two things that I know you're working on. Am I wrong about that? I've got two main things okay. I'm working on. One is a children's book. Okay, right. It's historical. Oh, maybe that's what I was thinking of. Okay. That's, and yeah. um, the other is an adult book that is much newer that I've just started that I've put to the side because I'm trying to complete the first project to be able to send it out and see if there's interest and yeah. have it have closure because learning how to finish and not be afraid of letting it out into the world because it's something I've never done. I've written a ton, I've performed a ton, but I've not written this form. Novel form is brand new. And because I'm self-taught, it's a riskier, or the, although it may be uh, an advantage. There may be things I'm doing quote unquote wrong, but um, at the same time, maybe that might be something interesting within what I'm doing to someone that may be a different way of approaching. But anyway, so the adult one is brand new and I'm not permitting myself to go back to it. I'd started it with, I had this flash of what I wanted to do, but I'm, I'm using it as a carrot to get myself to finish the children's one. I love that. Yeah. So I will, I will completely keep you posted when oh, I can't wait. that's something I can announce that either it, it's moved forward or it is done and may not move forward. But that's, that's a goal for this year is to put the finishing touch on this draft and allow it to, to be what it is. Yeah, I I'm excited. It. It's been a wonderful process working on it. And I love when I do get to see you, which is rare. It's because we <laughs> Thank all God have these you, busy you lives asked me and, to meet up and do this. Oh, I'm so happy. Um, I love that we can we kind of share that writing, like, how's the writing? How's the writing? How's the book? How's the book? There's something, you know, and just with other writers, like you just know, you know what that involves. And so I, I'm championing you on. Thank you. That. And is your book at a place where? I'm in that hallway that you just described where, you know, and, and, and for those of you that don't, aren't writers or aren't in this world, when you're an unpublished writer, you have to have the manuscript for fiction, and generally speaking, you have to have a finished manuscript to submit it. You can't just submit a proposal, which is something I didn't know until I got way deep into this process. <laughs> my, my coach at the time was like, well, you have to finish it. To, I was like, oh, oh, <laughs> so, yeah. which is fine. I was going to finish it. Like, I wasn't going to finish it, but um, there's, no, there's no candy bar along the way. You know, it's just, you've got to have this finished thing. And then a whole other set of work starts because if you're lucky enough to get an agent, a publisher, then you have an editor and then it's more revisions and more. So I'm at that stage where I'm revising, I think my eighth or ninth draft, and then I'm going to be submitting it to agents and publishers and things. That's but, great. Yeah. Exciting. And I also, similar to exactly what you just said, I have an outline for my second book, mm -hmm. but I won't fully dive into it until this one's out. Like not published on the shelves, but at least like I've the got, draft is done. Exactly. Yeah. I, I believe in that. I'm sure there's people who work a different way, but I'm dive into the pool one thing at a time in terms of how I like to be creative. So that's what it is. Well, good. Please keep me oh, and I your will. listeners posted. I will. Because that's exciting as well. And your genre is? Uh, contemporary women's fiction. Awesome. Very yeah. different than the two I'm doing. So we yeah. could, you know, 
we could promote each other. Of course. Although if we were doing the same thing. Yeah, we can promote we could each promote other no matter what. But yeah. I mean, in a business sense, as I've told you, my business sense is poor and my creative and, uh, you know, my teacher sense and my creative sense are strong and my business sense is crapo. So... I, I disagree like, with that. I don't well, think you know it's crapo. No, think, yeah. you know what? It's not crapo. But you were very specific about what you explained and you, you mm -hmm. articulated it beautifully about in that in those moments, in those years at the theater of not monetarily giving yourself value in that way. But yeah. you, you know, I just, that was such a great time in my life and so many others. Thank you again for providing that space. Oh. Okay, so we've come to the time in the interview where I ask every guest the same three questions and then I go into a lightning round of just silly, fun questions. Okay, cool. This is not like the actor's studio. I wish it was. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little different. Uh, okay, so what do you think about, Aliza, when you hear the word MILF? I don't like it. Okay. I really don't like more. the word. I think when it first came out or was in my awareness, I thought it was empowering. I thought it was, I understood it. The it, word itself. Yes. Okay. I not thought, the podcast. No. Okay. I'm not talking about the podcast. Okay. It, but you can. I just, yeah, go ahead. No, I don't want to. Okay. I want to talk about the word. Okay. Because <laughs> when you ask me what I think of when I think yeah. of that, I thought at first it was very empowering and in terms of seeing moms that way, seeing, mm -hmm. you know, a, a certain type of woman in, in a different type of way than me. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was bringing a shift, a good shift. Mm -hmm. But in my mind now, the place it occupies feels crass. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that other people feel like that, but I think I, I now feel like it's not necessary or maybe because there's the television show, single oh, mother right. and, you know, Smilf. Yeah. Um, that started to make me think about it again. So I think that put it back in my mind because yeah. I don't hear it a lot. Right. But I don't know. Maybe I'm just becoming prudish in my old age. I, I can't explain it. Yeah. Like I'm not totally comfortable with it. How do people, I'm going to ask you a question. Of course. Sorry to interrupt your lightning round. No. How do you feel people respond when you say the name of your podcast? It's interesting. I've had across the board, totally different responses. Some people say, oh, that's so cool. Or I love what you're doing with it. Some women say, I like that yours is mom I'd like to follow, which I always respond with, well, it's both for me. It's the F word and yes. also fo uh, is follow. Is it also follow? That's that's the, actually the title is oh. moms I'd like to follow. Okay. But it's a play on, you know, the acronym, which comes from porn. Right. I mean, it's derived from, that's you where know, it started. It's, a, it's a male uh, coined phrase. Yeah. And I didn't even, I I knew of the follow. But I didn't know that you were using it as follow for yours. Yes. But mine was just the the visceral response to yeah. MILF where it started as a, uh, an empowering thing almost. Yeah. Now I feel like in my experience of the word raw version of MILF, yeah. I don't know that maybe we're past it. Yeah. But not the follow part. Yeah. So it's interesting. But I, I agree with you. I think it's like it's almost... It may be because of the politics of what's changed about women yes. in the last year. So yeah. it's interesting. Yeah, it is an and interesting. I'm not dissing your show. I'm, oh, not? I'm, I'm just. And you can. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. If I want to, I'll totally do it. Yeah, but I, I don't really want would. to. I know you would. No, it's an interesting question, though, to think of how fast things have changed in terms of what that acronym, correct, yes. acronym yes. means. Yeah. 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 And so I, I love asking that question because I do get a lot of different answers and it is just interesting to think about. So, and we could go on about cool. it, but I'll go to the next question. What is something you've changed your mind about recently? Restraint and control and allowing, meaning I'm someone who liked to make a lot of good things happen in my life, personal life, outside of my personal life, and parenting. And now I think I've learned when to push and when to step back. Control. So what what I mean by that is um, I've changed my mind about being a good person, mom, whatever the category, how much I have to do. And I think there's a component of learning how much I have to not do and when's the right time not to do things, meaning allowing that dog to be as poorly trained as sometimes I think he is and not have it be a reflection of me to allow my kid the opportunity to learn 
from his poorly trained dog and care about it or not, um, when to fight and when to release things. That's what I think I would say. Um, and I've learned a lot. I had a, without going into the long story, I had a, a big change where my child asked to change his school at a time when I don't think it would be possible, like physically possible to make that happen. And exactly. See, there's his dog. And um, it's all of a piece. And I work, that's when I fought. That wasn't a sit back time. That was a time to bring my controlling strength and to make it happen. And if I would behave like that around myself, have the confidence and the energy to push like that for myself at the moments where it's appropriate, um, I would be a superstar. And so I learned a lot about the moment of fighting as well as like bringing it there as well as backing off and allowing people to make mistakes and learn. Let people be in pain. Let bad things happen and let everybody learn from it. I hate pain and I hate people suffering, including myself. So I think that's part of what that control is, releasing the need to do that for myself and other people is great and learning when I can trumpet my kid changing schools and making it happen and me and whatever. It's a big lesson. So that's, that's a long answer to your question. It was a good question. Um, how do you define success? I define, that's another good question. I define success as bringing out what you were put on the earth to do. So in yourself or others. So being, discovering what you're supposed to do, discovering what brings you joy, what, what makes yourself, others, the world a better place and doing that. You might be the best sandwich maker in the world. See, I'm back to my cooking deficiency. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to the lightning round. Okay, oh my God. I really hope my poorly trained dogs because of my son that I'm allowing to not train their dog well experience uh, will be quiet. Here we go. We're releasing control. Ocean or desert? Ocean. Favorite junk food? Oh my gosh. Fr Fritos came to mind, but uh, bread and ice cream are my go-to. Oh, so yes. warm bread. Oh, and ice cream. I oh. don't know if that's junk food, but that's like fantasy food. Sounds great. Movies or Broadway show? I'm torn. Movies, I think. Daytime sex or nighttime sex? Nighttime sex. Texting or talking? Talking. Why would you even ask that? Go on. Cat person or dog person? Both. Have you ever worn a unitard? As a... As a Young woman, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, I probably did. Shower or bathtub? Shower. Ice cream or chocolate? Oh, chocolate ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> On a scale of one to 10, how good are you at ping pong? Four and a half. What's your biggest pet peeve? My dog barking. <laughs> no, what's my biggest? Oh, my biggest pet peeve is mean people. Yeah, me too. I don't like that one. Okay, let's see. If you could push a button and it would create 10 years of world peace, but it would also place a hundred year ban on all beauty products, would you push it? Of course. <laughs> uh, superpower choice, invisibility or ability to fly? That's very hard, but I think I would do invisibility. But flying would feel good, but I'll go with invisibility. Would you rather have a penis where your tailbone is or a third eye? A third functioning eye? Yes. Sure, I'll take that. <laughs> Lisa, you're so pragmatic. <laughs> well, I mean, I thought I didn't know if that was a spiritual question. No, or that's it, many people have asked. Is it like, going to well, scare the, people? A, does the penis work? Is it a working penis? Do I have to urinate out of it? I've had no, all no, kinds I don't of want the penis where my yeah. tailbone is. Okay. <laughs> I wouldn't mind a penis in certain ways, but like that just didn't sound appealing. And then the third eye is going to put people off. Like you could hide that penis, <laughs> but the third eye... But then I thought, well, as you age, maybe you might need it. <laughs> like there's all sorts of things to think about. <laughs> what was the name of your first pet? I had so many. I think the first one I can think of is Shirley. What was the name of the street you grew up on? Huntington. So your, and we call it many things on the show. We call it your porn name, your oh, sure. cold answer name, your stripper name. 
is Shirley Huntington. Sounds a, a kind of fancy, a British fancy, doesn't it? <laughs> Shirley Huntington. <laughs> she doesn't take a lot of her clothes off. <laughs> Shirley Huntington. <laughs> It would be, uh, you know, I think it's, she's a period, uh, you know, a period piece. Like she was in the forties. I was going to say, yeah. Twenties yeah. or forties. Like just 40s. after the war. Just yes. after the war. Yeah. She wore ankle socks instead of knee highs. Yeah. Very risque time. And then she retired early and had a regular life. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. Aliza, this was a joy. Thank you so much. Thank you for talking to me. And I'm excited to follow what you're doing. You know, I hate technology. Do you know that? I kind of knew that. I, kind I don't. Of knew that. I really would like to live somewhere with like a typewriter. I, I yeah. really do. But for you, I'm going to embrace it, and I'm going to follow what you're doing, and I'm excited about what you are doing, and I'm excited to be. With you. Thanks, Elisa. All right, thank you. Thanks so much for listening, guys. I really hope you enjoyed my conversation with Elisa. Next week on the show, we have Brooke Christian. Oh my gosh. Brooke came to me through Instagram and I'm so glad she did because our conversation was rich and deep and such a beautiful tapestry and such a great representation of what I think a MILF is and what being a mom in today's modern world is. I really hope you tune in next week and have a happy Thanksgiving. I love you all. Thanks for listening.